Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, new live stream today. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about uh, Black Friday. I suppose, uh, as far as Sarah is concerned, we could talk uh, about the the Ser TMT days uh, because just a few days ago we published uh, a, a very very interesting book on on the regulation of. Uh, uh, digital platforms and, and digital markets. Uh, yesterday, we uh, published our recommendations uh, on the Digital Markets, markets Act. And uh, today, uh, we are uh, switching to, to infrastructure. So very, very busy. And um, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, all of us uh, are with us once again. And what will uh, hopefully be soon or or post COVID-19 environment, uh, telecom networks are and, and will continue to play a key role in, in the resilience of our economy and our society. And these networks are in addition, in the midst of a, an enormous transition, not only will their nature change, but the regulation that will be required is also likely uh, to change fundamentally. And to realize their potential though, Significant new investments are required in the telecom sectors and encouraging that investment is the central objective of both the, the recent reforms of the uh, telecom regulatory framework and ongoing legislative activities. And the deployment and take up of very high capacity networks, VHCN in particular, plays a key element in, in the planned investment program. It's central to the development of a European Union fit for the digital age, um, as we say now, uh, we hear in the Commission, and, and it's also clearly one, one of the pillars of, of uh, uh, President von der Leyen's Commission. And this objective was reaffirmed uh, last February in the Commission's communication entitled Shaping Europe's Digital Future, which is the, the digital strategy communication. And it has been further reinforced by the Commission recommendation on connectivity, which is a reaction to the current COVID crisis. So against that, that background, SER comes out today with its report of, a, of an important research project entitled Deploying Very High Capacity Networks, Competition Rules and Cooperation Mechanism. And I should say that these SER projects is, is part of our research track on the policies and regulation to stimulate the development of uh, VHC networks in, in Europe. And it focuses specifically on the needs for cooperation within the telecom sector and beyond, in particular utilities in other network industries, to speed up the deployment of fixed and mobile VHC networks. Our projects builds on a previous SER project on co-investment and network sharing, which uh, you may remember we presented, I think it was last May, uh, on a, a webinar as well. And this latter report on network sharing uh, concentrated on Article 76 measures dealing with, with co-investment and took the EU rule as a given. Now, this report, this new report, adopts a broader perspective because it looks also at Article 80 operators and it provides policy proposals in the new technological and societal context. So before starting our, our, our debate um, with the most interesting panel of speakers with us today, and I will introduce them in due time, I'd like to, to invite the, the three authors, uh, Tony Chortol, Professor Marc Bourreau and Winston Maxwell, uh, to present the, the key findings of, of the report. And for those of you who are watching us uh, online, uh, you can, of course, uh, raise questions. You can do that um, on the uh, Livecast platform using the, the Q&A uh, device, uh, or if you are watching on the SER uh, website, uh, you will also find uh, a Q&A uh, device there. Uh, which will allow you to put to put questions and we'll aim to address the, the panel discussions. Um, uh, we'll, we'll aim at, at addressing those questions uh, during the, the, the panel discussions. So uh, let's move immediately now with uh, Tony Shortall, who 
I understand is going to present uh, the the report on behalf of his uh, three uh, of the three colleagues, the three authors. Tony, please. Unmute myself. Sorry. Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so very happy to be here uh, to present your report. Uh, as Bruno said, uh, given the time constraints uh, that we face, uh, I'm uh, going to present the report myself on behalf of all three. Uh, Mark and Winston will, of course, jump in if necessary, uh, but we'll join the discussion later in any event. Um, as Bruno also mentioned, this is part of a series um, which SIR is undertaking, looking at very high capacity networks. Um, and this track is driven indeed by the new objective uh, in the code, um, which, and that objective, the new objective for uh, regulators to increase investment, ensure availability and uh, take up of very high capacity networks. Um, we Go ahead, Tony. Sorry, sorry, big word. Uh, so we see that in the code in a number of different aspects. So there's far more emphasis uh, in the code on infrastructure-based competition as a means to uh, encourage investment. And, and we see that through a number of measures which are primarily about facilitating entry, uh, lowering entry barriers. Uh, and we also see a, a number of supporting measures. Obviously, there are things like geographic segmentation and so on, but there are two important measures around, I would say, uh, co-investment, uh, as Bruno mentioned, uh, and wholesale only. So uh, we do have this new policy uh, objective, uh, and we have had a previous SER report, um, and we're looking at this to see how are all of the instruments which are in place seeking to support this new objective. Um, the new objective, of course, is more important than ever because of the COVID-19 context, and it's ever more urgent. Uh, and despite the good news around vaccines, this is unlikely to change anytime soon. So the previous SARA report looked at competition trade-offs, uh, and co but particularly, I suppose, in the context of co-investment uh, and Article 76. Within this report, we look at a number of different aspects, but uh, in particular, we look at the issue of co-investment uh, and separation uh, between networks and service provision. Uh, so this report looks at those trade-offs, um, and we bear in mind strongly whether there are still efficiencies to be achieved. Um, so this is important because if, in a sense, there are no innovations still possible, we might not be nearly so concerned about uh, sharing and other structural aspects. So a sort of a, a pertinent example might be uh, the move that we see generally in the market around uh, co uh, tower coals emerging. So steel towers, there's not much in a mobile context, there's not much innovation happening there. Um, and so that might give rise to a particular set of considerations. Now, uh, there are, I think it's useful to set out at the start some issues around uh, how we view technology and some of the technology changes that are taking place. Uh, from a fixed perspective, we see Fiber as uh, the likely uh, outcome for all fixed networks. But we also note that in a number of instances, people see this as a sort of end of game type scenario. We believe that when we look at it, there are a lot of different uh, technology choices that are still at play. So from a topology perspective, you see point to point uh, network deployment versus point to multipoint. Um, over those topologies, you can have uh, Ethernet, POM, a, a variety of technical solutions layered over those technologies. And many of these uh, scenarios are mutable. 
So it is possible using wave division multiplexing to layer a point-to-point -point technolo technology over a point-to-multipoint topology. All to say that there are a lot of different uh, scenarios. There's still a lot of innovation. And we can see a number of sort of scenarios which would constitute a new wave of investment. So we don't see fixed, even that migration to fully fibered networks, that's not necessarily going to be the end of that discussion. In a mobile context, equally, there are some very significant uh, technology changes that are happening. There's uh, an open RAN, move towards open RAN by some operators, which is really about, uh, and it's become more topical recently, but it's really about uh, separating services from the hardware in the mobile access network. Uh, and we have things like software-defined networks and network function virtualization, which are also relevant in a fixed context, but which in a mobile context, uh, taken together with other changes, means that there's a lot of possibility for operators on a common network to act independently in a way that perhaps wasn't possible before. So it's important to take a couple of minutes to think about these things at the start, because I think it informs a number of aspects uh, of the report. So from the report, we take uh, four uh, key recommendations in four areas. So I suppose the first uh, is around uh, the need to support infrastructure competition. We see that as being a particularly rich source of competition for investment. Uh, and we think there that uh, broadband cost reduction directive uh, needs to be strengthened uh, and to be made more effective. I'll come back to each of these a little bit more detail later. Uh, we also think that there needs to be uh, an attempt to streamline advices. So we have, uh, over the years, seen that policy uh, the emphasis of policy has certainly changed. So we have this new policy objective, which is investment in VHCN, and that's sort of embedded in uh, the code. But of course, there are a lot of soft law instruments and other legal instruments which predate uh, the code and predate the current policy objectives. And so we believe that there's a need to streamline those advices and make sure that they're consistent. Similarly, uh, when we look at sharing in a fixed uh, a mobile context, what we see is that, to a large extent, fixed tends to be dealt with through ex ante regulation, whereas issues of network sharing in a mobile context tend to fall under competition law. Uh, and uh, there's different objectives uh, on both parties, and we think that there could be a need to clarify, maybe for close cooperation and some clarification. And finally, we look at um, Article uh, 80 type operators and their impact in the market. And I suppose the policy recommendation there falls on Article 78, where we think that NRAs should consider having upfront uh, advice for operators who are um, considering uh, using Article 78 in the future. So just look at each of these in just a little bit more detail. So infrastructure-based competition uh, is uh, certainly the uh, most powerful form of competition from a network investment perspective. Uh, and we see that uh, infrastructure-based uh, competition is uh, re-emphasized in the code compared to the previous framework. Uh, measures to lower entry barriers and promote infrastructure-based competition should be enhanced, in our view, uh, in particular by strengthening uh, the broadband cost reduction directive. Network competition uh, has not always been a policy priority, but the importance of infrastructure-based competition is recognized in the code. But in order to be more effective in terms of its implementation, we believe that measures like the broadband cost reduction directive need far more input from uh, national regulatory authorities. We think they're particularly well placed uh, to provide that support. We see a need uh, to streamline advices. Uh, the code uh, represents a major policy shift from intra-network competition to inter-network competition. 
Uh, um, many aspects of the current framework were devised at a time when the policy objectives were uh, quite different. So the end, uh, next generation access recommendation, the non-discrimination and cost methodologies recommendation, uh, even the broadband cost reduction directive uh, stem from a time when the policy emphasis and policy direction was uh, somewhat different. Um, a number of those instruments overlap. Uh, so for instance, the code, the next generation access recommendation and the non-discrimination and costing methodologies recommendations all address a number of common uh, issues. For instance, pricing and risk, uh, even when and where some of the access products uh, might be granted. We are not uh, proposing in any sense that there would be um, uh, sorry, we're not proposing in any sense uh, that there would be uh, an inconsistency between those advices, but we would see uh, very significant differences in the emphasis, depending on which uh, advices uh, were to be followed. We think it might make sense to retire some of those instruments, uh, given the context, uh, and uh, we think that uh, perhaps where those advices continue to be uh, needed and there continues to be a requirement that they could be folded into uh, one instrument or even an existing instrument because several of them are under review currently. Um, the third recommendation uh, concerns the need to align on sharing uh, for both fixed and mobile. So uh, at an EU level, there's a practical difference between the regimes that are in place for network sharing uh, and co-investing in a fixed context versus in a mobile context. So in a fixed context, uh, the code and the associated soft law instruments are often linked to a finding of regulatory SMP which uh, means that mobile uh, falls outside of that regime. So while a lot of issues in terms of fixed networks fall outside of, uh, sorry, while fixed networks fall under the code, to a large extent, mobile network sharing is dealt with under competition law and has to undergo a competition law assessment uh, rather than an ex ante review. Um, to some extent, we would say that uh, they are out of step, and this uh, is unavoidable in some ways. Clearly, ex ante regulation has particular policy objectives, uh, and indeed, uh, the objective to uh, increase investment in VHCN is a telecom policy objective, uh, which could not, for instance, be embedded in competition law. Uh, however, we think that there could be a better alignment of the measures. Uh, we think this can be achieved through a number of different uh, elements. We think that there should be closer cooperation, we think, between uh, competition law and regulatory agencies. Uh, we note that a number of competition law instruments are out of step. Uh, so the general block exemption, the state aid, which are under review. But if we look at, for instance, the general block exemption, there was a redraft in 2019, there was a second redraft in 2020, neither of which mentioned very high capacity networks, for instance. Uh, and it just, there's, there would appear to be scope for better alignment. Um, we think also that there could be a, a telecom section in the uh, revised horizontal guidelines. We think that that would be beneficial. It might be a bit previous for DG Competition to set out how it will deal with technological changes which have not had significant mass deployment, even if their technology implications are fairly well understood. But we think that uh, there, could, there is scope to set out what the considerations and what the trade-offs would be in a competition law assessment uh, that makes a 
makes use of these new technologies. Uh, the final uh, aspect concerns, um, well, really it concerns Article 80, but the recommendation concerns the Article 78. So what we see is that uh, where significant uh, wholesale only operators, uh, as defined under uh, Article 80, enter markets, uh, this looks to be very positive for investment. So whether it is the wholesale only operator themselves or whether it is that the general environment which gives rise to Article 80 stimulates the investment, we can't say. So we can't say what exactly the causal, what the causal relationship might be. Um, but it may be that, um, but, but we do see where there are significant Article 80 operators that there is a significant uptick in investment in those markets. Uh, now, uh, Article 80 to an extent uh, is uh, driven by financial engineering um, because what are considered to be or deemed to be low risk infrastructure products such as duct uh, and so on are put, uh, the network is put into a separate company. It has uh, or is deemed to be low risk uh, and you have a resultant low cost of capital, and you also get significant new investors and new class of investors who are entering the market. Uh, there is, as I mentioned before, there's a kind of a parallel perhaps with towers in a mobile context. Um, so where you see, you take assets for which there are uh, low risk, uh, considered to be lower levels of innovation, so whether that's true or not is uh, a significant question. Uh, and you have uh, new investors uh, entering buying those low risk assets. The problem that are identified concern investment coordination uh, in separated firms. So the idea is that with networks and retail divisions separated, the risk might occur at the network level whereas much of the reward might arise at the retail level. And I mean, there are different views about this. It could be that it could be addressed through contractual relationships, but uh, there are concerns that with a, a new round of investment, with a new wave of uh, investment in networks, that there will be uh, a coordination problem and you might get hold out uh, and delays in investment. So the incentive or the network owner uh, might be undermined. Now, what we observe is that in most markets, in fact, in all markets today, there are also vertically integrated operators in the market, which act as a significant constraint and allay concerns about investment coordination, because with an integrated firm, those won't arise, and that network element will act as a constraint on the wholesale only operator. Um, we uh, would note that uh, as long as that remains true, uh, where our concerns are allayed, what we see is that um, if, or what our concern would principally be that if the competitive reaction to significant wholesale only entry was to structurally separate, so if the vertically integrated firms in the market felt obliged to structurally separate in order to compete, or that was their competitive reaction, then policymakers and regulators ought to have a significant concern about that. And so we believe that these concerns should be signaled well in advance uh, in order to, to limit the extent to which that occurs in the market. Um, just finally, uh, what uh, the conclusions are that uh, I suppose we see continued and ongoing returns from innovation, uh, both in fixed and mobile and across those markets. Uh, we think that there is a need for greater consistency both within uh, sectors, so both within the fixed and mobile sectors, but across both sectors, because in the future, fixed and mobile will be um, symbiotic. And finally, we think there are some significant short versus long-term trade-offs, particularly in uh, fixed markets around wholesale only. Sorry. That's, uh, I think, my time used up. So uh, I pass back 
the control to Bruno. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a very, a very clear presentation and, and you highlight very, I think, very well with your, your two co-authors, uh, the, the number of challenges which uh, I think uh, not only operators but also regulators uh, are facing. And we are going to, to, to hear about those. Um, uh, before that, let me just uh, remind uh, the viewers that uh, you can ask questions to the speakers, uh, to the panelists by, by using the Q&A function on the livecast page, which is hosting this event. And if you're watching along on the SARE website, you will find a link to the livecast page over there. So um, I'd like to, to move uh, to, to the second part of this, uh, uh, of this webinar, with, uh, which is going to focus on, on the models of organization for investment in, in VHCN, fixed and mobile. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Camilla Klotsch. Uh, Camilla is, is well known uh, to, to, to Ser uh, friends and, and, and viewers and Ser community. She's, she's now uh, the head of units of the uh, markets unit in, uh, in DG Connect. This is B3. And I would uh, immediately ask you, uh, Camilla, if you could uh, react to the recommendations and and the contents presented by the authors of, uh, of this report. Uh, what did you find interesting? What did you find useful? And uh, is there anything you, you disagree with? Camila, please. Thank you very much, Bruno. Can you hear me? I'm just checking. Okay. So thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, thank you very much for welcoming me and inviting me to this, uh, to this panel. Uh, just, uh, few points for introduction. I will really try to be short because I know that I have 10 minutes and we'll have also very interesting panel discussion. First of all, the report is very, very rich, and very, very interesting. And what is interesting also for us is that we, we are at the same time as you were uh, thinking and uh, preparing your report, we're looking on two very, very similar aspects uh, of, uh, of the deployment of very high capacity networks. And there are many, many aspects that I absolutely can agree with, starting from the fact that uh, technological changes and to much extent necessity coming from the COVID situation, indeed uh, encourages rethinking of some of the elements of our regulatory and competition approach. I will leave aside the competition approaches, including network sharing for Rita, who is more competent for sure than me to, to cover this one, and I will focus on the regulatory aspects that you, uh, that you mentioned in, the, in your report and in your presentation. Uh, still saying that we, we agree with rethinking of some of the regulatory approaches, we do strongly believe that the code, which is de facto now fully entering into force with, and will be applicable in the member states as of the uh, end of December this year, is the valid platform, is the valid regulatory framework. What remains to be seen, and this is where we follow uh, some of the elements of your advice, is how it could be complemented. How the focus on the very high capacity network, which is indeed in the code, uh, very important and additional criteria that we, that we added to the code, uh, to the regulatory framework, how this could be also fulfilled by other instruments and complementary measures, including what you mentioned in the context of the BCRD, directive and the review that is ongoing, including, of course, what we have already done with the connectivity recommendation that you also, uh, Tony, kindly mentioned, which is, of course, very much focusing on acceleration of very high capacity networks and 5G. And also other initiatives, one thing which uh, I haven't seen, it's probably of less regulatory uh, nature, but you mentioned a lot the, 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 the former, the, the, the communication that we released with the code gigabit connectivity. We are also now uh, on the basis of the guidelines from President von der Leyen preparing next uh, communication, which is very much focused on the digital decade and will also look, as uh, President von der Leyen mentioned, into very high capacity networks and connectivity. And I think that's uh, a notion of connectivity for all, the connectivity that's absolutely necessary, in particular in the time of the COVID, is the driving force for this, uh, for this communication effort. So 
I will try to, as I said, I will focus only on the regulatory aspect, and there are anyway many, so I don't think I will manage. Uh, I will very quickly relate to what we agree with you, which is mostly on the provisions of the code and, and co-investment, and a little bit on other forms of voluntary cooperation. Then I will go to the issue that we slightly disagree with you, which is indeed the fact how we plan to review the existing access recommendations. You mentioned the NGA recommendation, examination access, and non-discrimination and cost methodology uh, recommendation, which indeed we are planning to review. And I would say why we think that uh, that this review is necessary. And I will try it then to mention a little bit on some very interesting aspects which I had seen on the more nuanced approach to the wholesale only uh, model. And if I manage maybe something about BCRD and, uh, and collective English, but I guess it would be for the panel discussion. So starting with the code. So uh, absolutely true. Uh, for the main purpose of the main objective of the code, indeed is uh, very much focused on the deployment for high capacity networks. But again, I really have to highlight that this is that we should not forget about the other thing. I am always very much committed to how this framework and entire telecom regulation was uh, constructed and it is very much based on competition, internal market and end users' interests. And these are not exclusive, it's not only because I work for the liberal vice president that I'm saying this, but for me and I think the driving of course also in the, in, in the code, competition remains also very much the source of investments and incentive for, for the investment. On the issue of shift from service-based competition to infrastructure-based competition, I, I partially agree. I, we also see this trend not only in the code now, but I think we also see very much in the assessment done by regulators, and I see some of the colleagues from regulatory authorities. When you look at the recent market reviews, they are very much based in particular for the purpose of the regulating some markets or uh, lessening the regulatory remedies, uh, they are very much based on the assessment of infrastructure-based competition. And this is something which is becoming stronger and stronger. You will also see it in the upcoming uh, recommendation on the relevant markets, where we are also putting a lot of emphasis in the market analysis on the infrastructure-based competition. And we also clearly say, as Berek in particular had the opportunity to, to look into, um, that infrastructure-based competition is and will be the main basis for the, re the regulation of this market. So this is also something that we, we do agree. Uh, for the other elements, maybe I will briefly go to the, um, to the Article 76 on co-investment. You know that the BEREC is uh, about to issue guidelines. For us, co-investment is very much the instrument which will, we hope, bring the digital divide to uh, or reduce the, 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 the digital divide uh, in less densely populated areas in particular. We really hope that this uh, this uh, this article possibility to co-invest uh, and lessening of the regulatory obligations for the SMP operators who are co-investing will, will really bring the difference. Very much it depends, of course, on the guidelines. It's very complex article. Everybody knows that it was one of the most difficult to negotiate in the, in the code. So, what Berek is trying to achieve is this delicate balance, which would be on one side trying to specify as much possible the uh, promotion of consistency and regulatory predictability, and on the other side, allowing, um, allowing um, not being, what I want to say, not being over prescriptive, not being too too much putting additional, for example, conditions which we don't think that are necessary. So it's a very delicate balance that Berg is trying to, to achieve with the guidelines, and we are very much helping them with this, I hope, and we are very much looking forward. You mentioned, of course, Article 76 is not the only one when we are discussing this type of cooperation. You know that Article 68 of the code is very much focusing on the voluntary cooperation. And I see a lot of interest, and I think it's the right interest, in the Article 76 and possibility of the binding commitment. Basically, trying to ensure that the commitments, voluntary commitments that are presented by uh, SMP operators are made binding, and in that way also reducing the regulatory uh, influence. 
the, I will jump now very quickly to what we disagree because I think it's important for, 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 for this discussion. Uh, we disagree with the uh, with, with basically uh, lack of necessity for uh, reviewing the existing uh, access recommendations, which is indeed NGA recommendation and, uh, and non-discrimination and uh, cosmetology recommendation. First of all, the bare fact that some, first starting maybe from the NGA recommendation. Um, the NGA recommendation this is the oldest one, and indeed there are some uh, terms in this uh, recommendation which might be outdated, even starting from the concept of next generation access, and I think this is something we will for sure look into, and there are several others, but it doesn't seem that it's completely relevant. Uh, for the non-discrimination um, non recommendation, I think your biggest argument for scrapping it out is, uh, is the fact that some of the provisions are already reflected in the code. Yes, but the code has get, the code is directive. The code gives uh, general regulatory framework. Why recommendation is a way to give guidelines to regulatory authorities to try to ensure harmonization, to base ourselves on the experience of regulators, on the decisions by regulators, and trying to bring forward the best practices. And which for me is also one of the most important elements to to look into it is that the recommendation, the way we see it now, how it is developing, will be very much regulation focusing on regulatory incentives to foster investment into the high capacity network. So I would rather see this recommendation as a complementary mechanism and also broader mechanism than what it was so far. We are still investigating what would be the scope of recommendation, but one of the elements which for sure we see that some kind of uh, guidelines or, uh, or uh, advice would be needed is of course on price flexibility. There are a lot of important elements that we also need to discuss with moving away from the strict cost orientation towards more flexible pricing arrangements. One of them is for sure the fair and reasonable, which is, by the way, mentioned both under the symmetrical provisions and global cost reduction directive. So if we provide guidelines, the question is where to provide the guidelines on, on these issues as well. We are also looking in the context of this review in other approaches like fair bet that Ofcom was very much presenting and then can the comment. And, uh, and also some other regulators like Dutch regulators with uh, this year, this is this year with this country to touch more. Uh, we are also looking into important elements like how to incentivize migration from copper to fiber. Uh, the article in the code is very much focusing, of course, on the very important aspect of ensuring that the access seekers receive access with the migration of the from, from copper to, to fiber continue to receive this access, but I think there are also other elements that are worth exploring either in this recommendation or, or a bit broader. And last but not least, I did mention a recommendation on the relevant markets, which is very much looking into the markets that we recommend for the SMP type of regulation. Uh, for us, the upcoming recommendation would be very much focusing, of course, on the remedies, including, for example, very interesting aspects which is also very important from the point of view of uh, facilitating uh, the investment into very high capacity networks, which is the geographic differentiation of remedies and the practices uh, that the regulators so far uh, governed and which we would like to analyze and provide further guidance. So as I said, there are different, these are different aspects. There are a lot of many other aspects which I will not have time to cover. Uh, but I think one thing which I really want to underline and I find extremely interesting in the report is, uh, is um, your approach to different regulatory regimes depending on the infrastructure-based competition. I think there is a very interesting table, colleagues will see it after publication, will see it uh, in one of the chapters, where you, depending on the infrastructure-based competition develop development, you look into either signal market power type of uh, regulation, symmetrical or only competition law. This is very much what we are trying to do now when we are trying to streamline by different instruments 
the applicability of the SMP regime based with symmetrical, based with competition now. And indeed, implementary factor based competition is extremely important in this regard. So I will finish with this and uh, I might comment on some other aspects later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Camila. Uh, uh, this was a very, uh, uh, very, very uh, useful uh, set of comments that you made, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you've not exhausted uh, your comments, and we look forward to uh, hopefully give you the floor later in the discussion so that you can, uh, you can complete that. In any event, thanks very much. I, I'd like to move now to, uh, to Ben Reschner. Ben is the uh, chief economist of the Vodafone Group, and uh, Ben, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon. So it was great to have you on our, on our programs. Uh, I'd like to put you uh, a question about the, you know, the changing industry. We, the, the telecom industry didn't wait for, uh, for COVID-19 uh, to, to, to start changing. And, and today operators seem to be cooperating more on, on, on some investment projects. And, New business models are being explored as, as the industry seeks to improve returns on its assets. So I'd like to ask you, what is, the, what is for you the, the end game of this process? And, and how does industry navigate uh, towards it? OK, thanks, Bruno. And thanks for having me on the panel. And uh, thank you to the authors of the report. Uh, as Camilla said, a very rich report. Um, I, w I won't be so arrogant to say that I'm going to define the end goal. Um, I'm actually going to say that the, I think the end goal has been defined for us. And it is an end goal which has been defined as a result of, of the crisis we're going through. There is a clear direction that Europe is, is setting for itself, which is the twin transitions, the digital transition and the green transition. And to, to a large extent, I think everything that we look at in the context of, of this topic and more broadly about the, the um, communications industry should now be seen through the lens of the urgent need to, f to facilitate and accelerate these digital and green transitions. Um, and we have the means to get there to a certain extent with the recovery funds. I mean, that's a, a major step forward. Um, and it is what we, we believe it is a once in a generation opportunity to, to actually um, have a, a significant step change in digital and green performance. But let's not kid ourselves um, that the amount that is going to be spent on digital of those funds will not close the, the digital um, gaps that have been identified. And, there is a, a very clear need to what, what we say is crowd in private investment. Um, and by crowding in private investment, there is a need to, and what we still fully believe in is the primacy of market forces in setting the course of the market. Um, and the other thing that we have learned as an industry, um, but also as a, I would say as, as a continent, is that the European digital single market is not a nice to have. It's an absolute necessity. And we've, we've seen that the downside of fragmentation in terms of the effectiveness of being able to deal with significant challenges. And this has to be a lesson that we learn, that we cannot have fragmentation, there has to be a proper digital single market. And so with that as an overall context, um, to go back to your question, Bruno, what, it, what is the end point? I don't know what the end point is exactly, but I know what I can speculate and I say strongly suggest what it isn't. And it isn't four mobile networks with full national coverage competing with each other. And it isn't single monopoly fixed networks, you know, that, that, that is... Those are the extremes that simply are not sustainable in the context of achieving a digital transition. Um, and therefore, where we go to in between those two extreme points, it is again the part of the market and what Camilla said about geographic markets starts to become very important. The level of competition in different parts of the country and in different parts of Europe will depend on, on the specific situation in those areas. Um, but, but for us, monopoly networks are an absolute no-no um, and if you have them you have to find a method of competition and cooperation between players who are not in that monopoly area to ensure competition is maintained but likewise what we see is the the four the concept of a, a four nationwide mobile networks it just isn't sustainable at a time when our, our return on capital is below any measure of whack um, and that's not voted for per se that's the industry as a whole um, then the, the situation we're in today is simply not sustainable and so then bringing back this, this high level picture back into to the report and some of the, the points that have been raised, I think there's a really interesting um, point around competition law versus the ex-ante regulatory regime we have. And I think it, I think it was broadly recognised and, and credit to the Commission for this, that the code was a step forward in making more explicit the, the investment objectives um, and, and balancing out, to be perfectly honest, the deployment and take up of very high capacity networks. As I said, that that, that objective now should be broadened out to be the full digital transition taking into account digital skills human capital 
um, and the digitization of business more generally. But that is a very good starting point to have the investment objective more explicit in the overarching legal framework, which isn't the case under competition or where competition is seen to be an objective in and of itself without taking into account what it is that competition is meant to, to drive. And I think it'll be very helpful now within the context of a digital transition to, to um, align the way competition law is, is enacted with that overarching objective in order to achieve um, what Europe needs um, from its digital infrastructure and its use of its infrastructure going forward. Then, okay. uh, can I just make two, things? okay, I'm gonna run out of time, I'll make two more points then. Infrastructure-based competition is not limitless. And this is my concern, is if we make this strong policy shift towards it's not service competition, it's infrastructure competition, that you can have the risk, you have a situation like in Portugal where you just discriminate against existing operators by giving much better auction terms to a new entrant for the sake of infrastructure competition. No, there is a balance between the level of competition and what the, what the market will achieve. Um, and that, that's really important. And at the same point, there shouldn't be this exceptionalism. Oh, we believe in infrastructure competition, but we'll still add in extra layers just in case we can't, we can't do what we want. So add in a service competition if we want to. And in the, say, take the case of the Netherlands, spend a year in the courts with the courts throwing out a decision on joint SMP only to then go back to um, symmetrical access through the code as a second means for, for regulating. There has to be you know, a, a, clear, a clear and aligned view on how the regulatory regime and the competitional regime should be carried out with, a, as I say, my final word, a very clear objective towards achieving both the digital transitions and the green transition. Thanks, thanks very Thank much. Uh, thanks, thanks very much uh, uh, for, 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 these, uh, for these comments. I, 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 I think you went, you really went to the, to the point. Uh, and I know it's a kind of tour de force. I'm, I'm you know, asking each, uh, each of you, each panelist to, to talk in, in two, three minutes, but we have so many of you and with diverse perspectives that we don't want to miss any of you. So please, uh, be uh, stick to the to the, the two three minutes rules um, and 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 thank you very much and and sorry about that but really this is the only way for us to be able to to get a variety of perspectives so I'll move immediately to to John Regan John is a senior manager uh, at the Comreg which is the uh, Irish um, uh, telecom regulator and uh, John I I would like uh, to to ask you or or important is co investment going to be in order to achieve 5G in, in mobile? Do you see that as in, indispensable? Does that see everyone on, on one infrastructure? Do you see possibilities for, uh, for, 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 for wholesale only to be used to enable uh, 5G, et cetera, et cetera? All this in three minutes, please, John. Yeah. No, um, uh, no, thanks for having me and uh, there's some useful uh, insights in the report, I think, um, which I was flicking through again this morning. Um, no, I, th I think there, there is going to have to be a role, I think, for co-investment uh, in the future. I think I agree with a lot of what, what Ben was talking about. Um, I think there is going to be an increasing role for co-investment, network sharing. Um, I probably would come, I, I probably would agree with him as well. There's no future for, you know, a, a, a ubiquitous, or four networks, each with ubiquitous network coverage in a 5G world. It's just not going to happen particularly when um, retail revenues are declining in some countries, uh, demand is going up. Um, and in, in Ireland, for instance, we've got a large rural uh, rump. Uh, you just, you, it just doesn't seem feasible that you would ever get more than one or perhaps two uh, decent quality rural mobile networks. Um, so the only future may be co-investment. Um, to get to get that rollout uh, to advance, um, or or network sharing, or or something similar to that, um, I think is going to have to be required. The the level of revenues just for that level of investment just isn't going to exist, and without something like co investment, you you are going to end up going down the network consolidation route, which would see I don't know maybe one maybe two players uh, in any in any particular small country, um, or large parts of countries just left out and no 5G um, uh, coming down the road. Now, we, I suppose we're talking about 5G, we're talking about cell densification and everything else. We're talking about the next generation of 5G rather than the current generation that's being advertised, I guess, as 5G. But the next generation of 5G, the only way to see that will either be through network consolidation, large investment, an increase in retail prices, uh, or something like co-investment. Um, 
I think that's going to be a challenge. And then you've got the appetite from uh, individual countries towards 5G, towards infrastructure rollout, towards more, um, you know, poles and, and everything else around the country. Um, uh, you've got the appetite of the public for that. You've got an appetite for, in, is there an appetite for increasing, for increasing prices? Probably not. Um, so you could see there being a, a number of different forces that push the sector towards co-investment in some ways, particularly in, in rural parts of the market, um, where there just won't be the appetite for multiple competing infrastructures, particularly when you're talking about a dense network like 5G. Um, that would be all. The last thing I think you mentioned, Bruno, was, was environmental kind of aspects of this. And yeah, obviously there's going to be a, ma a massive, there's obviously the green agenda, which is quite important, and 5G is going to play a significant role, as is the kind of sector overall. Um, but even just on the landscape, 5G can have a significant impact on the landscape. And that's where something like co-investment and network sharing could, could play a, a very significant role in ensuring we can get um, near or near ubiquitous coverage uh, for something like 5G. But without, without something giving way, and I'm not sure what that thing to give way is yet, uh, it's, un it's unlikely we'll get widespread 5G in the next five years. Uh, that would be my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'm moving now to Michel van Bellingen. Uh, Michel is uh, uh, not only the chair of BIPT, the Belgian uh, regulator for telecoms and postal services, uh, but he's also uh, he's going to be the chair of, uh, uh, of BEREC in 2021. So, Michel, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for, for, for joining. And, and I'd like to ask you, is it becoming clearer now for you which, if, if any model of organization, is, is proving most effective to, to stimulate uh, investment in, in, in VHCN, uh, wholesale only, co-investment, etc.? Michel. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Bruno. And let me first of all uh, congratulate Sarah and, uh, and the three uh, authors for the, the very interesting uh, report. And going back to your, to your question, uh, Bruno, uh, Berek has no uh, preference whatsoever for one particular model of organization. We, we just want very high capacity network investment. And we've got a lot of it. And, um, well, preserving sufficiently uh, competition, of, of course. So, uh, no, Berek has focused on co-investment as it, it's a kind of predominant role model in, in, in Europe, as, as we have seen, and of particular importance for, uh, for Berek, there is the ability of other co-investors to compete uh, effectively and uh, on a sustainable manner in the long term on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory um, uh, terms. So each arrangement or situation will have to be examined on a on a based on a case by case uh, basis and, and on its own merit. And the same vision will also apply on only uh, operators on sale only operators. And I com can come back to to this later if 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 you like because I know that I have to stick to my three minutes. So, um, as mentioned by uh, Camilla Berg, is currently finalizing uh, guidelines to foster uh, the consistent application of the uh, co-investment uh, in and the con conditions criteria for assessing uh, co-investment in, in very high capacity uh, networks element. And these guidelines are non-prescriptive um, uh, document, and it's it's a way to 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 explain the, the manners, the, the different possible models of co-investment uh, in arrangement between operators. And in this document, uh, just to, to uh, remind you, there are three types of models, there are three models, the, the joint venture uh, model, of course, two or more undertakings, enter into arrangement for creating a, a joint venture and in order to become part of the joint venture and participate in the co-investment they, these undertakings acquire a, a stake in, in, the, in the joint venture. Another model is what we, we call the reciprocal access model. And, and this, in this model, each co-investor deploys an independent network in an exclusive area and grants uh, all co-investor access uh, to its network. To, just to keep it brief, 
There is a third model, the, the one-way access uh, model. And compared to the two previous uh, models I, I described, uh, one-way access model uh, in which only one um, single operator deploys the, ne the network infrastructure and offers all co-investor access to its network are in general more flexible regarding to the potential for late entry of uh, additional co-investor and regarding the potential uh, to increase the participation of existing uh, co-investors. But once again, each arrangement of situation will have to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis on its own merits to check whether or not it stimulates effectively the investments while preserving sufficiently uh, competition. That's all for the moment. Uh, over to you, back, um, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Uh, that's, uh, that's extremely clear. And, and we look forward, of course, for further interactions with you uh, before the end of the year, but after the end of the year, when uh, I will be able to call you twice, Mr. President. Uh, I will moving now to, to Sabrina Stanislas Boumier. Um, Sabrina is uh, uh, working with uh, uh, with Qualcomm, and she's uh, uh, I'm just uh, uh, she's a senior manager manager uh, government affairs at, at Qualcomm. Uh, Sabrina, thank you very much for for being with us, and okay. I'd like to ask you uh, if you could perhaps give a view on on the impact that. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, on the need for, for his investment and, and what are the next round of, of net network investments going to be? When are we likely to see the, the next waves of network investment in, in Europe? Sabrina. Thank you, Bruno. So first of all, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure for me to participate to this webinar. So COVID-19 pandemics has shown the real value of connectivity for all. Now, more than ever, Europe needs to stay connected. Digitalization, connectivity are really key for a quick economic recovery. The good news in Europe is that the Commission has proposed a 750 billion euro next generation UE package to revive the economy after the COVID-19 crisis. 20% will be directly invested in digital, included 5G recovery funds, also available at national level. This plan go in the right direction and position 5G in Europe at the center of the economic recovery strategies like in Asia and North America. Action to reduce the cost of deployment, stimulating demand across different sectors are very much needed in the next new years in Europe with an important role to be played also by public funding. A study commissioned by Ericsson and Qualcomm to Analysis Mason have modeled the potential economic value of 5G as an open innovation platform will add to Europe. The Conservative estimate amounts to 210 billion euro in benefits at a cost of 46 billion euro. Providing customers and businesses with the fastest 5G experience by fast tracking millimeter wave spectrum and associated network implementation will be important as this new wave of network investment and deployment will address extreme data demand as people do more video streaming, cloud gaming, as well as virtual presence for evolution of social, telemedicine and education. 5G fixed wireless access and private networks will also benefit from millimeter wave as it is complements fiber broadband and will enable emerging use cases in enterprise and industrial. Finally, let me comment on SER recommendation. This gets more clarity on the extent to which wireless technologies will benefit from inherent advantages of being qualified as BHCN and will have an impact on investment initiative and on the development of 5G ecosystem. Here at Qualcomm, we think that wireless solution capable of delivering fiber equivalent solution, in particular 5G fixed wireless access, should be considered as a VHCN. 
5G fixed wireless access solution can satisfy in the most efficient way the delivery of ultra high speed broadband to suburban and rural areas, supporting home and business applications where fiber is prohibitively expensive to lay and to maintain. So to conclude, infrastructure sharing and co-investment as instrumental for the deployment of very high capacity networks through 5G is a win for all strategy, where the town hall covers the telecom operators, the consumers, and the entire market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabrina. I, we have time, I think, for, for, for one or two, one question probably from the audience. I, I see uh, there is one question which has uh, reached us uh, uh, through the, the Q&A uh, function of, uh, uh, on the live cast page, uh, or if uh, you are watching along on the SER website, uh, you, you find a link to the live cast page there. And the question comes from uh, Frédéric de Backer from Telefonica, who asks you, um, Tony, uh, could, could you uh, explain briefly, uh, in perhaps a bit more detail, the coordination problem with uh, wholesale only? Uh, Tony. Thanks, Bruno. And um, thanks, Freddie. Um, so, the issue here is that with separated uh, networks and services divisions, um, that the incentives for risks and rewards aren't necessarily aligned. So the fear would be, let's say that uh, the particular service in question uh, that's identified by the retail operators uh, requires a significant network investment. Uh, now, those uh, investments will have to be taken by a network operator who does not have necessarily a good view of what's going to happen in the retail market. So they're not as well placed to make an assessment of how the retail market is going to uh, develop and how, how likely the new product uh, is to be successful. There's also a good bit of literature about where uh, the rewards for the investment are likely to accrue. The problem, of course, is that once the investment's been made, that investment becomes sunk. And so the question becomes, where are the rewards likely to, to arise? And there's a lot of sort of evidence and literature that would suggest they're more likely to arise at the retail, with the retail arm. So, so you have this twin combination of, uh, you're asking a network operator who has less ability to judge the success of a retail product, to make significant investments. Once those investments are, are made, there's a high probability that a successful implementation, most of the, the, the success is likely to accrue to the retail operators. Uh, with a vertically integrated firm, all of this is, is internalized, so it's not an issue. Yeah. hope that's okay. clear. I don't know if Winston or Mark wants to add anything. Winston or Mark? Or Mark wants to add? Do you want to add anything? So, so uh, I, I discussed there was one case in France in the late uh, 1990s. So at the time, so uh, there was a cable operator in France partly owned by France Telecom Orange and partly owned by Numerica. So France Telecom was operating the upstream network layer and there was a commercial operator, Numerica, uh, selling services to the consumers. And basically the experience was quite a disaster because uh, in particular with respect to investment decisions because the two operators could not coordinate on the timing, the extent, the amount of investment. And so in the end, the experience was that actually they, they both sold their, uh, their company to a third party, which was Altis. And then it became the, the cable operator that we know today in France. So I think there are anecdotal evidence, historical evidence, and this kind of uh, coordination problems that uh, Tony has, uh, has described. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we are now going to, to uh, we, we are now going to move to the third part of, uh, of this uh, webinar. And this is uh, dealing with the uh, uh, appropriate institutional design 
and competition uh, framework. And I, I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome uh, this afternoon uh, Rita Wesenbeek uh, to, to react to the recommendation and, and content presented by the, the authors of the report. Uh, Rita is joining us in his current capacity of uh, head of unit in DG Comp. Uh, but uh, let me uh, already uh, congratulate her publicly for uh, the new appointment that she's going to uh, uh, take up in the in the new year, uh, a bit later in the new year, as director in uh, DG Connect. So, Rita, uh, can you perhaps uh, tell us also, as as I asked Camila, uh, what you found interesting, uh, useful in in that report, and and uh, what uh, you perhaps uh, not fully agree with, Rita? We don't hear you, Rita. Uh, does, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Yes, you can. Okay. So then, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, also, compliments for Ser for uh, issuing another very pertinent report um, at a very pertinent time to do that. And compliments to the authors, uh, because it is indeed a very rich report. Now, I know that uh, we all have very limited time. So I thought maybe to give you a number of, of thoughts uh, that I had uh, based on the report, and I will try not to develop them too deeply. So maybe first, I cannot resist to make a regulatory com comment, um, which is that the authors uh, emphasize very much that uh, co-investment would be for the code, for the regulatory context, and mobile infrastructure would be for competition uh, analysis. So there, I think that is not entirely complete. Of course, uh, co-investment arrangements can also be assessed under the competition rules, and there's nothing preventing from regulators to propose regulating mobile markets. So I think the picture is not entirely complete, but in practice it will not, uh, not disturb uh, the analysis a lot. Um, so um, I would also think that from a competition perspective, the analysis of fixed and mobile networks can, of course, be profoundly different. And that in particular, because I think for mobile networks, there is um, this element that you compete with the capacity on your network, which is less true for fixed networks. So, um, so that's the first comment. Then another comment that was also uh, offered by uh, an appreciated colleague of mine, uh, uh, isn't the report too much relying on the notion that investments are driven by costs and uh, investment ought to be driven by profits and by return on investment. Now, you can, of course, have, a, have a, a wide debate on that, but to me, what it at least signals is that we shouldn't lose sight of the demand side of the market. So it's very important that uh, in the years to come, when we all want the networks to be rolled out, that we have a due uh, eye for the digital divide and for also industrial demand and other elements that will generate a return on investment, which will trigger the rollout, I would say. So then on the regulatory framework for co-investments, I really agree with uh, all the uh, valuable things that have been said by Camilla. And uh, I would say that uh, also from a competition perspective, right now the ball is in the court of the NRAs to make the assessment based in their national uh, context. And the NRAs will be very well placed, for instance, to market test uh, commitments. Uh, of course, then uh, it will move to the Commission, and then uh, the Commission, uh, both DG Connect and DG Competition, will be well placed to analyze what the NRAs hold. Uh, in that context, indeed, uh, we shouldn't overlook that there are already cases where also co-investment constructions have been looked at by uh, national competition authorities. Then mobile sharing, um, I think um, the views of DG Competition on mobile sharing are pre pretty much already known. Uh, just to be very succinct, it's very important to have a facts-based analysis. We agree that in uh, many cases, mobile sharing generates benefits for consumers, 
We do think that in outlier cases, there can be reason for competition concerns. You're probably all well aware that we are looking at the case of the Czech mobile sharing and that we analyzed whether we wanted to investigate the Italian mobile sharing and came to the conclusion that we didn't want to do that. Barrick has also signaled that, uh, in particular, RAN sharing may reduce the incentives to invest, in particular in, uh, in uh, densely populated areas. And there maybe I wanted to uh, also offer a thought uh, to the authors to look at the, you know, the, the uh, links uh, within the topics that they address in their uh, reports. Because when reading it, it occurred to me that the uh, holdout problem that they signal for wholesale only companies might actually also occur if you have a country split in uh, mobile sharing arrangements. So if party A is the master in one part of the country and party B is the master in the other part of the country, that means that the um, incentives for um, and risks, uh, uh, you know, for the investments in the retail part of the market of, of the other party will not always be clear to the master in the first uh, part of the country. So two important elements in the um, in the analysis. Um, first of all, uh, just to comment on uh, what's the, uh, sorry, now I see, I, yes. Can you still hear me? Yes, okay, good. So um, uh, for us, we look at incremental costs in particular, not necessarily at total cost. And what is very important in the analysis is what actually is the um, active sharing adding in terms of cost savings in addition to passive sharing. So that's that's the, the mobile sharing part. And in this context, I think it's good to maybe make a few comments on 5G and then on, on the, the, the issue of regulation. So on 5G, it's very interesting what the report notes in terms of the future concerning open RAN and other technologies that would allow um, more um, differentiated uh, utilization of a shared network. Uh, I think we follow that with interest and uh, it's hopeful and uh, we would hope that that will uh, introduce or preserve possibilities to compete. We should of course uh, signal that this is still um, future. We don't know yet whether it will deliver. I understand that Open RAN will be there at the earliest in two years. So here too, the element of facts-based analysis will apply. So it will be very important to actually investigate what parties are arguing on the basis of this uh, technology. So the question is indeed, um, will you, um, uh, will the, the new technologies allow partners in mobile sharing to make um, more independent choices when they apply um, these, uh, these technologies? And will they be less tempted to enter into compromises with their sharing partner? So these are the key questions. Then on the regulatory point, um, there, as I have done uh, already uh, more often, I think we need to moderate the expectations that there can be a block exemption for uh, infrastructure sharing. So first of all, these are highly concentrated markets. It seems very unlikely that with these kinds of um, safe harbors, uh, there could be a block exemption. The, the safe harbors that are needed if the numbers one and two or the numbers two and three in such a market uh, combine their forces. Um, also, uh, that means that parties are basically in the world of self-assessment where everybody under the competition rules is. And of course, we will, uh, we will try to uh, provide guidance through our cases and in the way we have already done it, for instance, in the Italian case, if and when it will be possible to say in a case that we have reasons not to start an investigation. So I think maybe as a conclusion, what is very good of this seminar and I think also of this debate, it's clear that we all want the same. We want those networks there. We want to help closing the digital divide and we want to help making the digital transition. So what is very good is that we have a discussion on how to get there and also how to analyze the facts that go into such an analysis. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you to you, uh, Rita. And, uh, and, and thank you for playing the, playing the game, as you said. I mean, we, we're really here in, the, in, a, in, in a situation where we try, on the basis of facts, uh, to have uh, deep analysis and, and to come up to recommendations which will hopefully uh, optimize uh, 
everybody's interest. And, and there are indeed a number of stakeholders. And, and that is, of course, uh, your game is to try uh, to keep uh, the, uh, the ball where it has to, 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 to remain. Let's move to uh, a regulator now, another regulator, um, which is also an institution member, member of SER. Uh, Marco Benocchio, you are the, the head of unit regulation of electronics communication markets at AGICOM, the um, Italian authority, uh, regulatory authority for telecom and uh, media. Uh, and, and I would ask you a very simple question. How, who, who should be regulating infrastructure sharing? Uh, does it need a, a unified response? Do you see the, the regulatory and, and competition law frameworks as uh, being conducive to allowing the sector to evolve? Marco. Okay, thanks Bruno for, for these uh, questions and for the opportunity to share views on the latest uh, SER, interesting SER reports. So, uh, uh, to be honest, your questions reminds me of the traditional debate concerning uh, regulation and, and competition and the sunset of regulation, the likely sunset of regulation in favor of competition, which is, uh, which is uh, a traditional, let's say, debate. Uh, and now I'm in the lion's cage between Digicomp and, uh, and, uh, and uh, companies, but uh, speaking as a representative of an NRA, I, I, I have to, to say and to state uh, that uh, according to, to all the elements that the SER uh, reports gave and all the previous uh, um, um, uh, people that uh, uh, speak be, uh, spoke before me, there is still room for a sector-specific uh, regulation uh, in, 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 a, in a very crucial topic uh, such as infrastructure sharing. So, Regulation and competitor, competition are complementary, of course, but at this stage, the, the, the bigger picture, so the regulatory framework uh, is important and needs to be updated. And now we have a, 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 a regulatory framework uh, a, a, which is uh, updated and is going to be updated with the other parts of, uh, let's say, uh, a regulation and soft laws, soft regulation, as a, as a recommendation, as a better guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, um, the, 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 the new role for, for regulation uh, comes from a, a wider and new S&P uh, uh, perspective of regulation uh, in the expansion of the scope of the S&P regime, um, access to civil engineering assets, uh, co-investment agreements that uh, everyone uh, uh, anticipated me are the next challenge for NRAs, uh, how to deal with uh, co-investments for the deployment to the HCN, but how to, uh, uh, let's say, evaluate this from uh, a, a, a competition, a, a competitive uh, uh, point of view. The more the scheme is open, inclusive, and reduces the risk, the more likely is the regulatory dividends. Is a green field, and, uh, uh, and so direct guidelines are very important in this, uh, in this uh, perspective to uh, ensure an harmonized implementation. Then we have uh, uh, the increasing role for symmetric regulation. So again, NRAs are more active. Um, uh, we think about Article, let's say, 61.3. Um, and again, better guidelines in order, uh, let's say, to, to, to define what is the first concentration distribution point, the point beyond the first concentration distribution point. So again, the harmonizing perspective is, is very important. And then, last but not least, uh, is, is in the middle between the network sharing, but the wholesale only uh, model, which is another way to combine uh, uh, the maximization of network usage and uh, uh, the reduction of incentives to discriminate and so on at the competition, uh, at the competition level. This model is quite incentivized in state aid, but also in a, a regulation because the scope for imposing to SMP um, or say only player obligation is, is limited. 
a, a gray, a little bit of gray, uh, gray area is for mobile infrastructure sharing where the interplay, the interaction between NRAs, the ministry and, uh, and competition authorities is, is a, a little bit more, let's say, complex. Um, and, and the SARE reports highlights this. And uh, in, in this field, uh, let's say the, 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 the competition law should play a, 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 a more important role. But okay, if you think about the development of 5G, uh, uh, a, a big part of this is backhauling. And backhauling is fixed, uh, is uh, reminds of the uh, core investments and uh, the develop and the rollout of bits of the So, uh, uh, a new role uh, uh, for, for regulation. Does it mean that 26 countries will play different? Of course, no. We are, uh, we hope not. And that the harmonization at the EU level is, is an, our next. Uh, uh, challenge and, and and this is why the Barrack role uh, is is so important and the Barrack guidelines are part of the regulations is something the soft law that will help uh, uh, NRAs and players uh, to, to 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 act on the on the market and uh, we just uh, lack uh, two. Um, main uh, uh, guidelines. So let's stay tuned to the next uh, Barrett plenary in December for uh, the, the guidelines on uh, co investments, uh, application of co investments, and application of uh, Article 61.3. Of, of thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, your name is Marco Benacchio. Uh, and, and not uh, Marc Bourreau. Sorry about that uh, to, to both of you. I, I would like to move now to, to uh, Grania Olsfart. Uh, Grania is uh, uh, Competition Policy Legal Counsel with, with Deutsche Telekom. Uh, great to, to have you with us again, Grania. Uh, and, and I would like to, to ask you uh, perhaps a, a high level question. Do, do you think that when you listen, you, you read the report and, and you listen to, to what uh, has been said so far, uh, would you say that we need a, a new regulatory paradigm in Europe for, for telecoms? Or, uh, and and, and what, what is that paradigm? And, and perhaps a, a side question also, um, how do you view the assertion that there are separate regimes for, for fixed and mobile in Europe? Do you agree? Do you disagree with that? Grania, please. Thank you very much, Bruno. And a lot to cover in two or two, three minutes. Um, but, but I'll try to do my best. Um, first of all, I think uh, the debate needs to be seen against the context of the changed telecoms environment, which the report rightly states. You have a very challenging investment climate. You have significant technology development. You have more competitive pressure also from outside, from platforms. So the regulation needs to change to account for this, to facilitate network sharing and remove the existing obstacles at the moment. And yeah, the report points to that there may be a different framework for network sharing because fixed is more driven by um, uh, regulation and mobile is more driven by competition law. But in fact, now me as competition lawyer, if I look at the competition law rules, they're the same for both. And uh, I, I can say from the practice, we've gone through the same scrutiny in, in both cases in fixed and mobile sharing. And the framework are the horizontal guidelines. Now, the problems which we see there and in our day-to-day -day basis is that we don't have a consistent application throughout the European markets. Um, so while DigiComp in the ongoing case is looking more on the infrastructure competition and innovation side, the Bundeskartellamt is looking more on the foreclosure side. And um, the second problem we see is the analysis is often based on dated technology assumptions. So um, the role of RAN has significantly changed in 4G and 5G versus 2G and 3G. We have virtual networks, we have software defined networks that do not play the same role on a service level where we have IP based services which are pretty much RAN agnostic. And the last problem, while, while there is always this overarching sentence, uh, we see the benefits of network sharing, we actually do not see enough recognition um, of the pro-competitive aspects, such as pricing aspects, quality, choice, 
faster rollout, and last but not least now, the environmental aspects that come there. Now, in order to, to bridge that gap also for future analysis, there has been an interesting uh, exercise on GSMA level to, to look into some future-proof principles to assess network sharing from a competitional perspective. And there we found some of the data principles need to be replaced by, by uh, more valid principles in the 5G context, such as, as the report also suggests, the uh, passive active paradigm uh, is, is, doesn't hold up anymore in the 5G world. Probably you would transfer that more to a hardware versus software layer analysis. Uh, the same with the urban versus rural split. I, I mean, we know in 5G we need more densification of the networks. We have a scarcity of urban sites that are suitable for 5G, so we might need more sharing in the urban area, in particular in 5G. So uh, the, the, the principles that, uh, from GSA May perspective, we regarded, and, and that's kind of the industry view, we regarded as more relevant uh, for the future assessment of network sharing agreements was the degree of cost communality that you find, um, the possibility for independent unilateral deployments, um, the options for differentiation on a technical and on a service level, and um, having an agreement that not is designed to obviously foreclose the market for other players. So I, I believe, and I will pause there because I know my time is probably up, um, that these are principles which are probably more valid to, to get to an assessment on the competitive side of network sharing agreements. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Grania. Um, I, I would like to move now to uh, Dr. Wei Kao. Uh, Dr. Kao is the, uh, the head of uh, strategy and uh, policy at the Brussels office, at, or the European office of uh, Huawei. And, uh, I'd like to, 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 to thank him for, for, for joining us. And I would like to ask you the following, uh, Wikao. If, if you could change one aspect in, in, in the regulatory regime you, you, you are now facing regarding network sharing, what would that be? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Um, it's my pleasure to participate the discussion today. Um, so you raise a very interesting question to me. Uh, so really from Huawei side, we want to play with it again, uh, but even the time will not go back. Um, you know, for the 5G, it's important business for Huawei, but when we come to the network sharing subject, I think the lesson and also the challenges or, you know, for, for, for us is still about, you know, how to accelerate the 5G deployment and also 5G development in Europe. So this is, a, you know, has been discussed not now, but from a couple of years ago, still we have seen many, um, you know, challenges in, in front of us. So um, from Huawei perspective, we see, you know, the, obviously the, the fragmentation of the spectrum you know, across the member states are still, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, big issues, which somehow make a slow movement, um, you know, for the 5G deployment across Europe. So that make the, a potential risk for Europe is still, you know, lacking behind uh, in the 5G. And also I, I, we firmly believe Europe needs uh, extendable, uh, uh, pr profitable, and also competitive, you know, uh, mobile infrastructure when we come to, to the 5G. So, um, so those are kind of, uh, you know, issues um, which request to, to work on that and also requires a better policy and the regulatory, you know, um, e to, to handle these uh, challenges properly. And also we see um, around, you know, the, the Europe, there were many and more challenges uh, towards the, you know, the, the telecom industry in particular for the operators. We see not only the, the fragmentation of the, uh, of the spectrum, and also we see now the more uh, serious issues, the challenges come from the global 
geopolitical conflict then come to the each um, member states that give the you know the fact is potentially decreasing the number of suppliers uh, in the markets and also which will potentially lead to the you know the the market distor uh, you know uh, distortion and also increase the operators uh, you know cost by uh, you know of building a high capacity network no matter we come to 5g or, or, or full fiber or fiber based network inf infrastructure and and so how to make the a uh, fast how to bring the the European 5G deployment into a fast land is somehow, um, and also take the opportunity of the VHCN and also constrain the co-investment, constrain the, you know, the network sharing and also constrain the, you know, the, the you know, many um, regulatory aspects which still provide a, a huge possibilities for Europe to catch up with it. So um, in general, we think uh, the network sharing is the, the, the trend, not only for Europe market, but also for the global market. But uh, there were many different technical approach when we talk about network sharing from the, the passive sharing and to the active sharing. And also there were, the, so those potential different approach should be uh, handled properly. So, so the teleco uh, regulators, also the commissions, are play a very important role to balance the challenges. When we talk about the, um, you know, the um, uh, the importance of network competition. So, how to avoid the potential damage to the competition, and also while stimulate the the investment. So those have to be addressed properly uh, when we talk about VHCN. And also thank more you, important- Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I have to, to, to get you now because we, we really uh, are running uh, with the time okay. and uh, we need to leave the same amount of time to, to, to everybody. So thank you, thank you very much anyway. Uh, I, I, I would like to perhaps to, to invite uh, for, for a final word, um, uh, Rita Wiesenbeck or, or Cam and Camila Klotsch. Uh, Rita, would you would you like to to start, please? What you you've heard, you participate, you you listen to um, this uh, these uh, one and a half hour. What what do you take from it? Yes. Um, can you still hear me? Okay, yes. Very good. Yes. Well, I think uh, the debate we have had and also the interventions of the uh, of the contributors have been very short and very intense, but they also show the richness of the issues we have in front of me. I think uh, this is a crucial time. Uh, we are about to see the implementation of the code, which builds on the hard work of the college, colleagues uh, at DG Connect. I think it is an excellent framework to use for the very challenging times that we are in. I think uh, Camilla and I, but Camilla can speak for herself, we will certainly take to heart what uh, what everybody is saying and we will also try to uh, to um, address properly uh, all the competition and regulatory issues that have been uh, raised by everybody so it's an exciting time with uh, very interesting challenges ahead uh, i'm happy to uh, to see the interest in your seminar and i hope that uh, as of now we can continue the cooperation uh, doing justice to to the input of this afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much, and, and thank you for your your very kind uh, words, uh, Ruta. And uh, uh, as as we say in Dutch, fail success in, in your your new appointment. Hartelijk dank. Graag gedaan, Camila. Uh, you next. Uh, what is your view from a, a regulatory perspective? Uh, on, on what you've what you've heard uh, uh, during this session, please. Thank you, Bruno. Can you hear me? Yes, I think I know. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have much to add to, to what Rita said. I think it's, it's really a very interesting report and uh, it is also proven by the fact that I rarely print documents when I am in home office and I did print this report <laughs> to read it very carefully and for sure we'll have pay a lot of attention when we will be developing our future, um, uh, future initiatives. Uh, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that we have to think through. Uh, I think what was extremely interesting is indeed this interplay between different instruments, competition policy, regulatory policy, and different elements of the regulatory policy, because we're discussing here different approaches from the significant market power type of uh, regulation through symmetrical, through broadband cost reduction directive, and other incentives. So a lot ahead of us, and we will continue working together. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Camila, and thank you for your for your contribution to this uh, to this afternoon session. Uh, the the final words uh, are going to be uh, for the uh, for the authors, um, Mark, uh, Winston, uh, Tony. Um, what do you what are your takeaway from 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 what you've heard this afternoon? Who wants to come in? Uh, as Winston, I just wanted to say that, you know, I've learned um, that there's a very healthy competition, so to speak, between competition law and ex ante. Uh, the two uh, fulfill different functions, and you need both of them. And sometimes there's friction, uh, but it's healthy friction. Um, and, and I think uh, one instance of this healthy friction will be on network sharing for 5G. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winston. Uh, Mark, is there anything you want to add at this stage? Yes. So, um, so I've learned that uh, in the end, it will be a case-by-case -case analysis. So many of these agreements uh, for co-investment or network sharing have many details that matter a lot for their impact on competition and investment. And in the end, the regulatory authority or the competition authority will have to go through the details uh, to, to assess uh, the deal and to see whether it's pro-competitive or uh, possibly anti-competitive. And this is what, what we also addressed in our previous uh, CERF report on, uh, on, on cooperation. So this is good. And um, so that, that's all, but the discussion was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marc. Uh, Tony, back to you. Yeah, sorry, yes, thank you. And um, thanks to all the participants. I mean, I was about 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 ten pages of notes, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go on everything that I've picked out. But I thought a couple of things were very interesting. I thought Ben's point about you know if you're going for infrastructure competition, you need to decide how much of a backdoor you're going to have in place uh, for services competition. I thought you know the point of you know even if the rules are consistent, they need to be applied consistently. I mean I think there's just so much change uh, taking place currently. And I think it was very reflected in the comments. I mean, I think we're all sort of grappling to, to deal with them. I think the code uh, is, is, is a brilliant piece of work. And I think, you know, how we uh, finesse those final advices and look at its application is going to be really important. And I think, yeah, the world's work is well underway. But I'd like to thank everybody. I got an awful lot out of this. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you to, to you, uh, Tony. Um, I, I'd like to, first of all, uh, I, you should know that, uh, viewers should know that the, the report is, uh, is available, obviously, on the, on the SER website. Um, and uh, before switching off, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Camila. Uh, I would like to thank Ben, uh, Michelle, John, Sabrina, Rita, Marco, Grania, Wikao, for their reactions and obviously uh, to my dear colleagues, uh, Tony, Mark and Winston for their excellent work. I would like also uh, to uh, have a special thank to the, the CER team who's uh, delivering uh, these uh, seminars, you know, one after the other under uh, very, very extremely uh, stressful conditions because it has to be very good. Uh, and when you have three in a week, uh, it's a challenge, so uh, well done, uh, Ser team. Uh, thank you to the technical team also. And thank you to you, uh, viewers, for your attention and your support. Take care of you. Take care of others. Bye. <laughs>